Welcome to the Traces Center for History and Culture in downtown St. Paul, Minnesota in the Landmark Center. My name is Michael Lewick Trams. I'm the director of Traces, and we're thrilled to show folks our museum, the different components. What we have is something very unique in all the world, actually. It's the only museum that we know of that documents the relationships between one group of people in a region, the Midwest, with people from another country, in this case, Germany, or occupied Austria, in a specific period of time, again, in this case, 1933 to 48. In our museum, you'll find very few pictures or references to Churchill, Stalin, Roosevelt, uh, Hitler. In fact, I think in the whole museum, there might be two pictures of Hitler. We're not really interested in the story of the so-called big cats, but rather the, the little people, the people in history who um, are mostly forgotten. Our museum focuses on narrative history. We specialize in presenting you photos from the people involved, their diaries, their letters, their photographs, their wood carvings, sketches, clothing, toys. And we do this to bring the history to life. And while we're not beating on the Germans, neither are we certainly not pro-Nazi, we're not also saying the Americans were always the uh, good guys in World War II either. We go beyond the polemics and we're saying, how were people on both sides affected by war, especially when, quote, enemies came face to face and put down the guns? How do human beings interact with each other when they're not shooting at each other, but there's a war on? Our museum will tell that story. The museum is broken down to about two dozen different exhibits, all of which are a stone and a larger mosaic. How does war affect people on the ground? Here we have the entrance of our museum, and in the first room there are three stories of imprisonment. Midwest POWs in German camps in the Third Reich, thousands of German soldiers that we in the British captured and brought to the Midwest and other places, plus um, we tell the story of German-American internees in places like North Dakota and Wisconsin. The Upper Midwest has a special relationship to the story of American POWs in Nazi Germany. For example, the 34th Division, which is headquartered in Iowa, but it has armories in at least four of the states, I think also Nebraska, lost 1,800 men on Valentine's Day night, 1943, to the Germans as POWs. It was the largest catch up until Battle of the Bulge at the end of the war of American soldiers. And those men were um, marched through the desert from Tunis, where they were captured in Fayette Pass and Kazreen Pass, sent in rickety planes to Naples and Italy, and then put on boxcars and sent to Nazi Germany. So we open our exhibit about the Midwest POWs in German camps talking about Midwest men, um, both soldiers, and on the other side of our column, we have panels about the airmen. There were hundreds, if not thousands, of Midwest airmen who were also captured by the Germans, and their stories are a little bit different. They were in um, Oflags or Luflags, which were built for officers or airmen, and, um, and their treatment was better. All of the men, though, had rather hellish experiences as POWs in Nazi Germany. We're interested really in sort of the sociology or anthropology of their experiences after the initial introduction of their pre-captivity lives and how they got captured. We then talk about the transport to the camps. The men were packed into train cars that had no heat nor any cooling. Uh, often there was no food. And when the Germans did bother to give the men water, as an example, they'd put a bucket of water in the, in the train cars, the freight, box, uh, freight car boxes. They'd let the men drink the water. Of course, later the men had to urinate, defecate, they'd use the buckets. At some point, the Germans might open the door again, dump the, context, the contents of the bucket, give them some more water, but notice I didn't say that they washed out and sanitized the buckets. So Midwest and other allied POWs in those transport boxcars were getting dysentery. Often they had wounds from the battles they'd just been captured in. The men were often um, sick. We tell those stories, and then the other panels go on to look at um, captivity thematically. What were the men doing in their work life in the camps? Uh, often the men were sent out to work on farms or in factories, or to shovel coal or chop wood for the power plants. We talk about their free time, their theater, the concerts they would give. We also discuss loss, homesickness, relationships between the POWs. They fought in the barracks, they made jokes, they were buddies. Um, they conflicted over food, sometimes over politics. Those American POWs who are minorities, the uh, Native American code talkers, including Meskwaki code talkers from my native Iowa, um, African Americans, the Tuskegee Airmen, including men from Des Moines uh, who were captured and were in the Tuskegee Air Corps, 
they weren't treated very well by most of the um, white Anglo-Saxon POWs. So we talk about that story. One of the panels is about the encounters between the Midwest POWs and the Germans they worked with. In one case, the Voss family actually saved American POW's lives by smoking them food, and on Sundays would give the one teenage daughter bribery money. She'd go down and wait on a tree stump by the stream. A guard would bring Phil Musker of Des Moines, Iowa, POW from the 34th Division, to the meeting point. The guard would get his bribery money, and then Phil would spend the rest of the day in the Voss house in civilian clothes, eating Frau Voss's ersatz coffee cake, listening to the forbidden BBC broadcast and having Sunday dinner in their, in their dining room. These are the kind of stories that we tell. The end of this exhibit focuses on the death marches at the end of the war. We talk about the men's liberation and their recovery often in Camp Lucky Strike, Camp um, Camel, uh, Camp Marlboro, other places that the American army set up to re uh, give these men rest and recuperation. And finally, the point of return to the United States. And the very last panel is what we call reconciliation. How did the American POWs later confront this experience? It had been traumatic. Some of them that we interviewed, we interviewed about five dozen of these men. They were still, still filled 40, 50 years later with so much hate for anything German that they didn't want their grandkids to go on an exchange trip, for example, to Hamburg, or they would never buy a Volkswagen car. Others, however, struggled to come to terms with their experiences and not project that kind of hurt and hate, understandable as it might have been. So on our last panel, we actually have articles from the New York Times and other papers and photos from a 1965 reunion where Midwest POWs, former POWs, brought former camp administrators and guards from one of the camps in Germany to the Midwest to a POW reunion, and both sides simply talked about the war as they had experienced it. We find that a really good example of reconciliation work. Initially, we focused our exhibit on the Camp Algona system. Algona was the base camp for 35 branch camps spread across Minnesota, where there were 20 branch camps, Iowa, where there were 10, and the two Dakotas, which both had two um, branch camps of Algona. We tell the stories of the German POWs in the Midwest. We've, in the meantime, expanded our exhibit to focus on all of the Midwest camps for German POWs, as you can see on the map behind me. We're interested in the story of how the men were captured. We talk about their transport to the United States, how they were unloaded in sh um, shipyards in Boston, New Orleans, New York, but especially, it seems, Newport News and Virginia Beach. The men told us in the interviews with them that they were put on Pullman cars. They were quite surprised. In Europe, German soldiers were transported by their own government, by their own army, to the front in freight cars, like the American and other Allied POWs had been once they were captured. Anyway, they were put on Pullman cars and sent to distribu distribution points across the Midwest, where they might be sent to um, work assignments in trucks or on um, buses or small trains. So we look at, again, the experience of the men once they were here. The camp life, the camp money they were paid in, a dime an hour even. Um, in, in, if the uh, soldiers were working for farmers and, and lumber companies that paid 50 cents or 60 cents an hour to the government, the men made a dime an hour. And by the way, the United States actually made millions of dollars on this program, so it wasn't uh, an early case of, of gratuitous welfare. Officers, by the way, on both sides didn't have to work outside the camps. Neither our officers in German hands nor the German soldiers here. That did change after May 7th, May 8th, uh, with the Nazi capitulation. A lot of the German officers wanted to work because they knew that Germany lay in ruins and they wanted to earn extra money, especially cigarette rations, to take back to Germany and use the cigarettes as, as currency. They knew that Germany was ruined, and they thought all the resources they could take with them, the better. As with the Midwest POWs in German camps, we talk here about the free time of the men. We talk about their um, artwork, the theaters they held, the talent shows. We talk about their physical art creations. And you'll see uh, images of their paintings, watercolors, oil-based paintings, their wood carvings. The men were particularly prolific in um, carving wood. The US Army couldn't keep broom handles on stock, for example, because the German soldiers would Shanghai them and carve them into handmade chess sets. Our next exhibit um, takes us into the, what we call the Midwest Main Street, which tells the stories of Midwesterners who were living in, in the Midwest, in the American heartland, and yet even so far away from Nazi Germany, were directly affected by the rise of, of Hitlerism and, and the ideas that were coming out of the Third Reich. 
We talk about anti-Nazis. Uh, for example, Hermann Stern, who ran a clothing store in Valley City, North Dakota, he himself, a Jewish immigrant from 1903, actually 40 years later used his own resources, his own money from his business, and worked with Senator Gerald Nye from North Dakota to bring about 140 friends and relatives from the Frankfurt area to safety in the Twin Cities, uh, Fargo, Moorhead, Valley City. He helped them adjust if he could to find them jobs. For a while, Herman Stern actually contemplated setting up Jewish agricultural colonies in the Dakotas, but later people talked him out of that. It became too difficult to get refugees out of the Third Reich, plus even then agriculture was quite capital intensive. We talk about pro-Nazis like Henry Ford and Charles Lindbergh, Minnesota's own aviation hero. These were men who at least initially thought the Nazis were doing great work putting people to work and um, ending social deviance and, and lawlessness. We talk about the American German Bund, which was the American Nazi Party. We talk about the Staatsanzeiger, a newspaper in North Dakota in Bismarck that was printed in German, but was very pro-Nazi and, and very anti-Jewish. There were, unfortunately, too many of those papers around, those that have survived the indirect censorship of World War I. In our grain elevator, we talk about German-American immigrants who by the Second World War were established farmers in places like Iowa, where I'm from, and they actually hired German POW labor during the war. The irony is the father in one of these families <coughs> had been a German POW himself in World War I in France. And <coughs> a generation later was actually hiring other German POWs from the next World War to work on his farm in Iowa. Right next to the exhibit about the German POWs and American immigrant farmers who hired them, we have an exhibit in what we call the Central School. We have several exhibits, one about Anne Frank's Iowa pen pal. Before the Frank sisters, Anne and her older sister Margaret, went into hiding in the Netherlands, these two little German-Jewish refugee girls from Amsterdam were actually writing letters to the Wagner sisters in Danville, Iowa, to Anita and to her sister Betty Ann. In the same building is the story of um, another Iowa farm girl and her Austrian pen pal, Maria Lickar. Lucille, um, was writing, Lucille Nelson was writing letters to this girl, and her responses became increasingly pro-Nazi as, as the letters were exchanged. And in the same school building is an exhibit of Ernst Krenick. He was um, a composer from Vienna who was, quote, a decadent artist. Other stories that we would tell on our Midwest Main Street would be that of the Von Trapp family, the Sound of Music fame. They actually came to Iowa and to Rochester, Minnesota, and gave concerts here in 1942 or three. We would like to put up bigger exhibits about the German prince who fled the Nazis and ended up at Hamlin College, now Hamlin University in St. Paul, where he was a guest lecturer for a, a semester or school year during the war. We would tell the stories of North Dakota nuns from, again, near Valley City, who were in France when the Germans invaded um, France in 1940 and were actually trapped by the uh, events around them and were held as American internees behind German lines until they were exchanged, ironically, for German-American civilians who had emigrated here in the 20s and 30s, the story to which I referred in Vanished. And finally, we would like to tell the story of um, other Midwesterners who were affected by the rise of Nazism. We'll continue that story in the Berlin Opera Square. I think we moderns often think that uh, the world was never so great and sophisticated as it is today. But indeed, already in the 1800s, Many Americans went back to Europe on business. They went to go to graduate school if they were from the elite. People went to visit relatives. And with industrialization and mechanization and big steamships and railroad lines, those, those tours got more and more uh, affordable, even for the middle class. So and indeed, there were numerous Midwesterners living in Nazi Germany, or working there at least, in the period when the Nazis took power in January and March of 1933 right up until the bombing of Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941, at which point those who were still living in the Third Reich um, were subject to being interned, which happened quite a bit. This room, what we call the Berliner Opernplatz, or Berlin Opera Square, tells the story of those Americans who were in Nazi Germany, the people who were interned after Pearl Harbor. For example, George F. Kennan from near Milwaukee, Louis Lochner, a reporter from uh, Milwaukee who was living in Germany, married to a German woman. He'd gone after World War I. Other American journalists and diplomats who were still there when we entered the war were taken to Bad Nauheim, a resort town in the Taunus Mountains near Frankfurt, and were kept uh, for some time until they were traded um, for German Americans here. Again, all these stories are interlocked somehow. 
We tell the story of the American ambassador to Nazi Germany, William, F., uh, William E. Dodd from Chicago. He was a professor of history there, and he was sent for about six years to Nazi Germany until, as he said, paraphrasing, he couldn't stomach it anymore, watching what was happening to the Jews, and, and he hated the Nazis' disregard for civil liberties and for freedom of press and for freedom of ideas. His adult daughter, Martha Dodd, was with him, as was her brother, their adult son, who went to the University of Berlin for a while. The Dodd story is very interesting because Martha Dodd actually had romances with both communist radicals who were being persecuted by the Nazis and with SS, an SS officer. So she was all over the map politically and romantically. And as, she, uh, as it later turned out, she and her later American husband were actually um, sympathetic to the Soviets and later defected to the Soviet um, region and lived in Prague where she died in the 19, early 1990s. Her story of the Nazi period is, is told here. We tell stories of other Midwesterners who are grad students, uh, a man from my hometown, Clear Lake, Iowa, Harold Vedeler, who was a graduate student in Nazi Germany in spring of 33 and watched the torch um, rallies, as it were, through Bryn, the Brandenburg Gate, watched the huge uh, demonstrations pro-Nazi and, and observed this takeover of the Nazi, by the Nazis of the German democracy that had existed briefly after World War I. We tell the story of Frederick Kaltenbach, an Iowan, who was Hitler's most important English language propagandist. Frederick Kaltenbach would use American slang and uh, the language of the American heartland to win the confidence of listeners here, people picking up radio raves from Germany and, and were broadcast further, to try to t tell the American audiences how wonderful Nazism was, especially before Pearl Harbor. We also have the story of Mildred Fish Hanak, uh, a Milwaukee woman who married a German graduate student, Arvid Hanach, uh, in Madison, Wisconsin, moved to, Nazi, uh, moved to Germany with her husband before the Nazis took power. And during the Nazi period, she and her husband were actually spies for the Soviets and the Americans. And eventually, they were betrayed. They were actually on holiday at the time on the Baltic coast. They were picked up. They were brought back to Berlin. She was in a mock trial, sentenced guilty. And she was guillotined. Her husband was hung from the neck until dead from meat hooks. So this is the room where we talk about those stories, indeed, of, of Americans colliding with the Nazi experiment in often tragic ways with horrible results. So far on our tour, we've been to three imprisonment exhibits, camps in Nazi Germany for our men, the camps here in the Midwest for German soldiers we and the British captured and brought as POWs to the American heartland. And we even looked at the stories of German-American civilians, internees who were interned in the United States. We've looked at life in, in the Midwest. We've looked at the Midwest Main Street and at Midwesterners who were living or working in Nazi Germany. Well, what about those people who were from Europe who fled the Nazis and escaped to America. Our exhibits behind us um, are all about German and Austrian, Hungarian, other refugees who fled Nazi-occupied Europe and sought a safe haven. It would be easiest to say they came to the United States, but that's not the full story. Some of them went through Casablanca in Morocco. Some of them went through Cuba or Martinique. In one family's case, the husband got on the last ship that left Bremen, arrived in New York, on the last day of August 1939, and of course World War II started the next day, September 1st, 1939 in Europe. His wife, Rosel, and their six-year-old daughter, Bertel, were stuck in Nazi Germany for a while. The plan had been that finally the family would uh, get the right papers and the, the money for the steamship, and they'd join their father, Gustav Weiler, and they'd all end up in the United States safe and sound. Well, it didn't work out that way. By the time Gus, as he was called here, got the um, visas and the ship money and etc. The war in Europe was so intense that the wife, the mother, the, the little girl couldn't escape through the normal routes. And so they actually took a, a train from Berlin to Lithuania, Lithuania to Moscow. Quakers living in the Soviet capital helped them. And they went further to Vladivostok, took a boat to Korea, uh, Seattle, and a Greyhound bus from Seattle. Washington to Iowa, where they rendezvoused with their father, who was waiting for them at Scattergood Hostel. Scattergood Hostel is the exhibit through this doorway. It tells the story of 186 Jews, some non-Jewish political dissidents, artists, intellectuals who fled the Nazis and were given a safe haven by Midwest farmers, Quaker um, college kids, and others who found a safe haven for these people in what had been Scattergood School, a boarding school in the West Branch, Iowa, the home of Herbert Hoover one of the American presidents who we know supported the school 
and uh, the Quakers had approached to support the hostel. We don't know if he had actually followed through and supported the hostel as well. There is a good connection, though, with this story because Hoover, of course, was all interested about the fate of refugees in World War I. At any rate, at Scattergood Hostel, the Quakers gave these new Americans, as they called them, English lessons because English was not yet the world language. It was still French. They gave them driving lessons because in Europe, really only the very rich had a car, and if you were that rich, you had a chauffeur. So most Europeans didn't know how to drive a car themselves. They didn't, most of them didn't know how to speak English as they would today. So at Scattergood Hostel, the staff, there were 49 of them over the uh, four years of the hostel's existence, they tried to help their guests, as they called them, adapt to American life as best they could. For their part, the 186 refugees took English lessons, driving lessons, but they also learned to cook with American measurements, cups and teaspoons, rather than the metric they were used to at home. They learned American songs from the radio. The Van Trapp family came and sang for them when they were in Iowa in, I think, 1932 or uh, 42. All in all, it was a rather amazing story of sort of a Shinnel's List on the Prairie of these folks, total strangers, finding their way to the Iowa prairies. This is before superhighways, before satellite dishes, before jet engines, and these people ended up in the most unlikely place on the planet in the middle of the Iowa prairie. It's a story that inspired me. It uh, lured me to begin this whole trip, uh, so to speak, into the, the Nazi past. My doctoral work in Berlin was about Skagood Hostel, another Quaker and, and related refugee projects during World War II. Skagood Hostel was an important refugee center from the Quakers' overall project, but it wasn't the only one. The Quakers had hostels or other refugee projects in Nazi Germany already in the spring of 1933. Hotel Falkenstein, again in the Taunus Mountains near Frankfurt. Other Quaker projects for refugees were in the um, Pyrenees on the French-Spanish border in England and in Cuba. In the United States, Scattergood Hostel was the first of the Quaker hostels. It was supposed to be a prototype for up to 22 other ones. The only other one that we know that was built in a similar way was Quaker Hill in Richmond, Indiana. There were summer projects that Quakers ran at borrowed mansions along the Hudson River, Nyack, New York, and other uh, places up and, up and down the Hudson River out of New York. But those were different. Those were seasonal, where the American Friends Service Committee, the AFSC, thought, oh, we'll send these refugees fleeing the Nazi horror um, up the Hudson for relaxation to get away from the, the heat of Manhattan in August and July. And indeed, those were just seasonal. The refugees would go there. For, there'd be concerts, some nice food. They'd take them on, on trips to Bear Mountain and other places. But at Scattergood Hostel and here at Quaker Hill in Richmond, Indiana, as I said, the, the refugees really struggled to become Americanized, to learn the language better, to learn about American ways and customs, American government. Lectures would come from the University of Iowa or from Earlham College to either of these hostels. They would be visiting Quakers, dignitaries, if you will, on their way from the East Coast to the West Coast or to Chicago, drop by and, and see what's going on at the two hostels. The program at Quaker Hill was more urban. The refugees often had jobs in Richmond, a little industrious town with a, a bus manufacturer and several mills, whereas Scattergood was really very rural. The refugees didn't work off-site. They actually lived almost communally, where everyone worked in the garden or the chicken house or in the kitchen. And so both of these hostels ran a shoestring budget. In fact, Scattergood ran at a deficit for three and a half of its four-year existence. And ironically, when Scattergood had just got enough donations and other funds to be solvent, they couldn't get enough European refugees in from Nazi Europe. The war was so intense, and so they had to close it. Originally, the Quaker staff and the Quaker supporters in the neighborhood said, well, we've got this hostel. It's going so well. We've got really good staff. We've got the furnishings. Let's bring Japanese-American internees from the desert of Arizona and Idaho or anywhere else and sell them here in, in West Branch. And some non-Quaker neighbors threw fits. There were angry public meetings at the local West Branch High's gym. They had guest speakers. The FBI sent representatives. And like in a bad B-rate movie, the locals who didn't want it said, no way, not in our backyard. So both of these hostels have very mixed and colorful uh, histories, and we're trying to present some of that here. Again, these are just small stones and larger mosaic, the effects of war. The Nazis called their annihilation of European Jewelry the final solution. Well, the final stop in our museum tour is related to the final solution.
This is what we call the black box. This was a project co-sponsored by the University of Minnesota Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies. Our former board chair, Stephen Feinstein, who unfortunately died last year, helped create this and fund it. This is a unique display of photographs by Minnesota and other Midwest soldiers who happened to be at Dachau or Buchenwald or other camps at the end of the war. Jean Rinke, ironically a Jewish doctor from St. Paul, was a young medical worker in Patton's troops at Dachau, and he happened to have slide film in his camera when they arrived at the gates of suburban Munich's most famous concentration camp, Dachau. He took pictures that are the world's only known still color photos, color images of Dachau. There is a color film that the Imperial War Museum in London has, but the world's only known color stills hang right here in the Traces Museum, and those are next to black and white, so very sobering images of what Midwesterners found at Nazi concentration camps. In the 1930s and 40s, the middle of the American heartland, the Midwest, seemed a world away from Europe. Indeed, without jet engines, without internet, transatlantic phone calls that were cheap and easily accessible, it did seem like people here lived on a different planet. But our fates were tied to each other. What was going on in Europe wasn't in isolation what happened here, as we've shown our viewers, our museum visitors the last three years here in our museum, that indeed, even then, in what we consider to be ancient times, 70 years ago, what happened to one set of people on one side of the globe deeply, significantly affected another set of people on the other side of the globe. And if that was the case then, then what can we say about the relationship between peoples today? Indeed, our museum, the Traces Center for History and Culture, has looked at the different fleeting traces of these stories before all the players are gone. And we try to preserve and to feature the stories, the experiences in their own words, their diaries, their letters, their articles they wrote for whatever purpose, their sketches, their photographs, their rec uh, recordings at that time of what they were going through. It's our hope that when moderns, be that today or in 50 years, look at these stories, that there will be universal lessons to be learned from the experiences of this very dramatic time, this Nazi experiment of 1933 to 45, and for us here, the three years thereafter to 1948, as of course, history always has a long shadow, and this was no exception. We're thrilled that you've been able to share these stories with us today, walk through our museum. It will be leaving the Landmark Center soon, we hope that someday the stories will once again be visible somewhere else, but at the very least, um, here's a record of what we've had available to thousands of people the last three years here in St. Paul in the middle of the American heartland. Thank you. <laughs>